let's see, you know, three years ago, Martin's right. I stood on uh, the dice stage and I made this public declaration to make happiness the priority at Splash Damage. And I did this because I truly believed that happy and engaged employees would do better work and that it would be great for the business as a whole. I knew that this objective could only be achieved if I could answer three questions. There were so many great writers out there that provided this kind of thought and feedback. Simon Sinek had already done it with his TED lecture, which of course was fantastic. But even Aristotle in his idea of rhetoric believed that the best way to make an argument to compel people to do things was to demonstrate with ethos, credibility, you know, the benefit of listening to you, logos, the logic of sound argument, and then pathos, the passion of the argument. And we translated this into three questions. You know, um, why do we exist? How do we behave? And what do we do? And we set about answering them and we felt pretty good about ourselves. You know, we had this impression that we existed because we wanted to create lifelong friendships. We were a company that was founded basically by three mates that played Quake, who then quite nepotistically hired all of their mates for years and years and years into the future. And then over the years, we started to kind of build some kind of following. We knew how we behaved, that we valued, you know, um, things like loyalty and friendship, and that these were critically important to us as companies. And this is really what inspired us to do the work that we did. What we did, in essence, was to create video games that champion team play, that created experiences of collaborative and competitive uh, advantage for players. And they, when playing as clans, would become friends and would have friendships with other people as well. Now this work, you know, this was important to us, and I had this really strong sense of belief when I left the stage from DICE that I'd nailed it. You know, as we do, <laughs> us bosses, especially because the thing about London, that, that hotel was ritzy, there were lights, there were cameras. I really believed I'd sort of worked this thing out. And then I got back to the office on Monday and I sat there in our meeting room. And I'm not gonna say that Splash Damage's office is a salubrious, but we were above a pound land. If you're American, that's basically a dollar store. Um, in fact, actually, our meetings were typically interjected by either dogs barking, which I assume were chained up outside the dollar store, or babies crying, which I guess must also have been chained up outside the dollar store. <laughs> Gosh. But you know, I hadn't really got to the bottom of this problem. So I started doing a whole bunch of research. I read tons and tons of business books. I read white papers. I asked the managers and owners of other businesses. And because happiness was the focus of my subject, and I'd already studied some of the posi psychology, I started reading spiritual books too. I read the Bible, the Quran, the Torah, the Dharmapada, the Tao Te Ching, even the Bhagavad Gita trying to get to the bottom of this subject. And actually I started to get a feeling for what the issue might be, but I was really struggling to articulate it. And then I read something from a psychologist called Carl Rogers. For those of you that aren't familiar with him, Carl Rogers originated a whole bunch of theories people call Rogerian theory, but he was fantastic I mean, he's kind of like number two to Sigmund Freud in a bunch of the ideas that he had. But one really cool idea he had was this concept of congruence, that people, you know, their personalities, they're kind of at their healthiest when their ideal self, what they envisage to be the best them, is in close proximity to their actual self, and that's in close proximity to how they're perceived by other people. And the greater the distance between those three things, the more likely they are to suffer mental health issues. It sounds like a complicated issue, but in lighter terms, imagine that you're answering the door to your mother-in-law. The guy who answers the door is typically not the one with his belly showing, watching TV, drinking a beer, unshaven on episode in a row 46 of Stranger Things or whatever else it is that you're watching at the time. You're clean shaven and freshly dressed and on your best behavior and feeling pretty good. My contention though is that in companies who are incongruent, those companies whose internal motivations they would never want the player to know, those discussions that they have in the boardroom that they would never want their employees to know, who know that they're inwardly being manipulative and exploitative, they're typically not healthy companies, they don't retain staff, they have terrible problems with politics. My contention was that if you could eliminate uh, the causes of this, if you could get a company's actual ideal and perceived self closer to the center, then you could reduce politics, perhaps eliminate turf wars, tear down silos, increase productivity, and all these great things would come. So I set about essentially trying to solve that problem. Now, I felt um, quite inspired when Tony Shea talking about culture 
Culture is one of those weird concepts. We struggle sometimes to understand what people mean by it, but it's really nothing more than those weird customs or traditions that exist in your studio, your company, that don't exist elsewhere. Ask anybody new who's arrived a couple of times, you know, a couple of weeks after they arrived, what's different here, and they'll tell you what your culture is. They'll understand pretty quickly. Tony Shea from Zappos.com, a guy who took a company from near bankruptcy to a billion dollars revenue and then a billion dollar exit with Amazon, he believed that if for a person their character is their destiny, then for a company their culture is their destiny. The problem I had is I didn't know how to improve the culture of a company. It seemed like a kind of a, a difficult challenge to achieve. And then it struck me, reading some great stuff by Pat Lencioni, a facilitator who's helped huge, huge companies, much larger than mine, um, to achieve success, that there were basically three questions that I needed to answer. The first question comes about as a result of the market. You know, if you think today, the top companies in the world, they've proved you can make a game essentially in any genre, on any platform, let's see, in any business model, pretty much in almost any business territory and have a success, have a huge success, massive success. There's almost somebody in the industry doing everything that you could possibly consider doing. So how do you work out how you should succeed? Essentially, you need to differentiate yourself from the competition, but it's a complicated concept. And therefore, this first question, how we was, will we succeed, in essence, to get a company whose core purpose is more closely aligned with the staff who work for it and the fans and the players who want to play our games. The second question was really one of trends. You see, the, the top trendsetters in the world, they are dominating globally, and they've been doing it for years and years. When Gabe Newell created Steam at Valve Software, you know, when uh, Brandon Beck, who's in the audience, started the MOBA industry, now multi-billion dollars as a result, you know, of looking at that part of the market, at mod makers and what they were doing and what was exciting. When Wargaming worked on World of, World of Tanks, you know, Victor Keasley with his obsession with real-time strategy games and wanting to create a really awesome tank simulation, a tank combat simulation. These trends, of course, are leading us somewhere in the future, but we don't really know where we're going. And we're almost never arrive where we thought we were going to arrive. And if we don't know where we're going, and even if we figured out how we're going to succeed, how the hell do we work out what's important right now? Is there some way we can always know the answer to what's important right now, almost irrespective of the segment of the games industry? And that was a really interesting question, too. But the third one was perhaps even harder. We have a global skills shortage, there's no doubt. We have an industry that's expanding at such a rate across so many territories, across so many different platforms, that it's creating demand for hyper-specialization that never existed before. When you think about the way that the market works today, we don't need programmers anymore. We need cloud-based strategists, cloud-based analysts, cloud-based programmers. We don't need designers. We need business intelligence guys who can design, who can also do SQL queries. Of course, we need designers too, but we also need community managers that have to be television pers personalities, that have to manage 10 social media platforms and understand the nuanced differences of each, lest we say one thing wrong and our entire reputation is destroyed overnight. All of those things, they're scary, scary prospects, but they're done by people. So we, if we figured out how do we succeed, if we figured out what's most important right now, we'd still need to answer the question, you know, who will do what? When I was... Um, five or six, and I suppose this is an important topic, talking about mental health and trying to be congruent as a person, not trying to fake who you are outside versus how you are inside. I suffered from mental health issues. I was diagnosed as hyperactive by doctors. To be true, I basically just bounced off the walls the entire time. My mum tells me now, I essentially knew one word, which was why. <laughs> Everything anybody said to me ever, I would just say why, 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 it was adorable, obviously. People would have loved it. Um, <laughs> I lived out in the country in England, uh, in the West Country, where people essentially live in black and white in the 18th century, and I was prescribed with Valium, which is, of course, what you give a child of five when they're really hyperactive. They effectively sedated me for about five years. When we moved to London, we moved into this halfway house, my mum coming out of a difficult relationship with my stepfather, and in this halfway house for battered wives, the doctors came and looked at me and they said, why is he being given Valium? <laughs> and of course, they stopped it immediately, but no one really understood what the impact would be. 
The impact was that as immediately as I went to high school, I couldn't pay attention. I just had no ability at all, just no interest. I was interested in some things obsessively, and then lots of things I was just completely scatterbrained. In fact, I was so scatterbrained that one day walking to school, I think I was 12 or 13 years old, I got on a train and I went to central London instead. I'd heard about video games, I'd heard there was a conference in central London, and I was going to go to it. And I snuck into Earl's Court and walked around this place, I think until I got thrown out, looking at Commodore 64s and Spectrums and these incredible games that were on offer, and I was just obsessed. I found my first obsession in life, and now I just had one problem. I basically lived on a subsidized housing estate with a single parent, an ex-alcoholic father, and no cash, like zero cash, no ability to get into video games. So I hit on an idea with some friends. Essentially, actually, you know, if my mum watches this, I'm going to get in trouble, but essentially, we would climb out through our bedroom windows, luckily mine was on the ground floor, and then we would scarper through the parks and the back streets at 2 o'clock in the morning, helping to avoid the police, who would obviously be unhappy with 12 and 13-year-olds running around at night. And we would queue up outside this milk depot, this, um, this place where, I don't know if you have milkmen elsewhere, but in England, it's a kind of quaint, cool concept from the 70s and 80s, electric buggies, dude in a, in a, in a, in a white jacket who carries bottles of milk all over the neighborhood and delivers them to doorsteps. Well, we'd convince them to let us help them. The idea behind this being that if they'd let us work a shift with them, they'd give us two or three pounds and we could go and buy some video games. So it was cool. It was an awesome idea. Fortunately, it sort of finished at 10 or 11 o'clock in the morning, so I couldn't really go to school. So 13, 14, 15, I didn't really bother. Got expelled at 15 with no qualifications, and now I was completely screwed. And my friends, you know, they were going to get their A-levels and they were going to get their degrees. So there was no way I was going to be able to compete. I got on a train up to London again, and I went up to Tottenham Court Road, the kind of birth of video games for the UK, where they sold Commodore Amigas and Atari STs. And every shop window had that ball bearing over the chessboard spinning on it, because it was the most graphical thing that we'd ever achieved in the industry. And I managed to get a job at a computer company that built and sold PCs. But what I didn't realize at the time, and I suddenly had an epiphany two, three years ago, was I got the job not because of my qualifications or my experience, Frankly, that would have just made me exactly the same as everybody else that was applying. Everybody had the same degrees, the same qualifications, and everything else. I got the job because I was obsessed with video games, I was obsessed with computers, and I loved talking to people from the doorsteps of doing the milk round. So these three things were differentiators that gave me an edge over the competition. And it was from this that I started to understand how we might succeed as a company. There's a fantastic white paper by Michael Porter called What is Strategy? And in it, he asserts that strategy is nothing more than that which differentiates you, that which gives you a position that you can hold, that gives you a competitive advantage. A lot of people think they're being competitive when they're driving down costs, improving production, improving efficiency, trying to you know, get their staff to work harder and faster. But the truth is what defines us, what delineates us from the competition, irrespective of what's going on in the market, is how niche we are, how contracted we are, how specific and distinct. At Splash Damage, when we set about answering this question, I forget whose framework it was we used, but certainly we plagiarized it from somebody else. We just got tons of post-it notes, lots of wool and blue tack, and we identified all of the activities that we pursue that make fans happy, all the things that we do that make money, all of the stuff that we do where we believe we're doing something really innovative, innovative and distinct. We sorted it into areas of commonality, created connections between the two. By the time I finished, Honestly, I feel like people would have been concerned that my mental health issues were coming back because my boardroom is on the breakout room with staff. So everybody at lunch can see this crazy mess of post-it notes. But we identified three strategic anchors that are right for us, and it's quite an easy thing for you to do for yourself. For us, we realized that we had been most successful over the years when we'd worked on Blockbuster IP, when we worked with the best partners, with the best platforms, and when we didn't pursue every opportunity. You see, a strategic anchor not, is, is not just like a, a thing that defines what you will do, but it also defines what you won't do. It helps your managers make decisions about what they should turn down. Our second strategic anchor came about as something we'd kind of call mission control mindset. This transition from packaged games to digital, this has already happened, we all understand that. But a lot of new people, especially people coming to us from other studios, still think we're going to ship a game at the weekend and move on to something else. The idea for mission control mindset comes from the idea that players really care about server uptime, about latency, about content delivery. Now, I, when I was younger, I suppose I must have been 27, 28, like most of you, I'm sure you would phone in sick when a really cool game came out and spend all day playing it. 
I was playing Ultima online. I think I was a glorious Lord Grandmaster Mage. And it was really important that I be online that day. So I phoned the investment bank that I worked at and told them I couldn't come in because I was dreadfully sick. Went downstairs, turned on my computer, and the servers were down. Now, there is no worse feeling than skiving off work, making that completely irreversible, I'm so ill and there's no way that I can come back in decision, and then finding out that you can't actually play. Because especially as a gamer, I have no other hobbies at all. There's literally nothing to do in mind. There's just a computer, I play games on it, and then there's work, and I go to work, and they're the only two things that exist. I think I just sat there motionless, not knowing to do for ages for ages. So we started Fireteam out of this belief that we should take control of that. We should try not to abdicate control to partners. When you do your own strategic anchors, you'll come to completely different conclusions. But for us, having that foundation of quantitative control, we also needed qualitative. Uh, Min Kim sent me a fantastic reference, a book called The Ultimate Question 2.0. It really proposes this idea of something called the Net Promoter Score. All of that doesn't really matter. It's just a metric. It's a way of asking consumers and fans what they think. And we set to work starting to use that as an idea, but I'll come back to the topic in a little while. These three strategic anchors did nothing more than identify what differentiated us from the competition. Blockbuster IP, mission control, mindset, multiplayer focused. You know, of course, being very independent, putting the player first. And we'd answered that question, but now we had to figure out what we were going to do now, what was most important. A thing that happened, I suppose, a little bit later in my life was that I found myself sat at a desk in a television studio and had accidentally become a television producer, presenter, commentator. It wasn't like a career that I chose. I was working as an IT guy at a video games company who had a member of staff who had a nervous breakdown, and they called me, and they said, we need someone to go on set. Can you please run over there and take care of this? And somehow we went on to do two, 300 episodes of Lock and Load in Quake Republic, really the kind of early birth of esports and television commentating and presenting. And I loved it. I had an absolutely fantastic time. We had some really interesting experiences, though, because the television company, really, they just didn't give up about video games. There was so much politics that they were contending with internally, so many interdepartmental turf wars, that we were really left to our own devices to, to produce the content to run the tournaments. One day, we had a clan that was a no-show, so I invited some friends, uh, Jim Rosenol and, um, and Odie, to form a kind of a special clan that could turn up and play an exhibition match, a friendly. They did. It was called CFA, and they turned up and played, and we started to commentate. Looking down at my kind of cliff notes for the commentary, I started talking about them and their name, and about a minute later, after I'd said it two or three times, I realized that CFA trolling me live, broadcasting to potentially 160 million install base in Asia, although frankly, only Dave ever commented on the forums. Trolling me, they had called their clan chronic fecal urgency, and I'd said it three times live on television so far already. And then as I looked at the scoreboard as we were coming to the end, I realized that they'd named themselves butt plug and speculum, and I'd said it 50 or 60 times on live air. <laughs> I loved it, though, of course. We had a fantastic time, but I realized something incredible then. We aren't the entertainment. I'm not the TV presenter or the commentator, not the video game that people are playing, and certainly not those television producers who couldn't figure out what was, to write, what was right and couldn't align behind any kind of specific concept. It was the player in multiplayer that's entertaining. That single moment at that point was when we founded Splash Damage, Richard, and Arnout and I started Splash Damage. Jim Rosenor, who was playing in that match, went off and founded Rock, Paper, Shotgun. Odie started Clan Dignitas, one of the dominant pro gaming leagues today. And the two other guys on the other side, who still won't admit it, I'm absolutely positive, are Ralph, the founder of ESL, and Neox, who were present in many of the other games at the time, but won't admit to chronic fecal urgency. What this taught me, I suppose, was that at that moment, we didn't know trends, we didn't know the future, we weren't analysts, we didn't know anything about business intelligence, we weren't reading any of the reports, we just knew as gamers what was cool and what was really good fun. And it spawned for all of us superb careers in the industry, a fantastic decade to come. When we're trying to work out what's most important right now, I found another fantastic white paper. It's by Robert S. Kaplan. I think it was written in 2007, and it's about balanced scorecards. This one you don't have to go and read because we created a much simpler version of exactly the same thing. We decided, what if we took the power away from the directors and the officers who continuously directed people and told them what to do, 
and instead said to our teams, 50, 60 leads, managers, directors, go work in groups to figure out what the most important next objective is. Go and figure out together the thing you'd love to achieve given three months or six months. Stretch targets. We don't care if you fail them, just set themselves for you and your team. And we started with a small pilot group. This initial group of HR, IT, finance facilities, the Strategic Council, set some objectives and they achieved them all, despite being ridiculous. And it really surprised us, we didn't expect it. So these scoreboards were prettied up and we turned them into something that we could display around the studio and television screens and we invited more teams to get involved and we started to define more strategic goals for different teams. In effect, we created boards of directors at every level in the company and gave them the autonomy and the independence to decide their objectives. And all we asked them to do is keep it in line with our core purpose, don't do anything that contravenes our values and make sure you stick to what it is that we do in the way that you achieve these goals. Not only did we start to achieve you know, things that made me feel really proud um, as a developer, I think the thing that really surprised me most was just this sense that autonomy, people are better at doing stuff when you let the 100 or the 200 of them do it than the three or four who sit in the boardroom thinking that they should micromanage or direct. And proof of this, as we'd now figured out what was important right now as a company, not just at the strategic council level, but across the entire organization, came when we started to try and answer this question, who's gonna do what? Now, the problem that I described before, this issue of hyper-specialization, it probably originates in Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations from 1776. Certainly, he talked a lot about how, you know, the best way to organize a workforce is to slice them up and work out what their specialisms are and train them and, you know, basically get them to focus on everything and you'll get much higher um, productivity. And that's certainly how a lot of factories are ran today. If you look at factory lines, People have organized things so that I pass you the toothpaste lid and you screw it on the thing and I pass it to you and you stick the label on and that's how the toothpaste comes out of the end of the line. But we're not making you know, factory goods, we're doing things that are complicated. The best analogy I've ever had told to me was that making video games is a bit like building the landing gear on the space shuttle as it's landing. <laughs> this, um, this concept then of factory production lines was completely blown out of the water by a counter thesis by Dan Cable at London Business School, the professor of organizational behavior, who said this is simply not true and I can prove it. So he went to factories who had had, you know, every ounce of Kenpo extracted out of their systems and he just walked up to the workers and said, come with me and took the staff into a room and asked them what they would do. And he spent like 30, 40 minutes with them and they walked back out in a different order and increased productivity by 30 or 40% by doing the jobs they wanted to do. It was this phenomenal epiphany moment for Dan Cable, and I think it was an incredible thing for me to learn from him personally. So we implemented Net Promoter Score, not as a consumer test, but as an employee test of happiness, of their, their, their willingness to recommend the studio. And we knew it was gonna be important, so we created our own application, which we ran on the desktop every single month. And in this application, we asked one simple question. On a scale of zero to 10, how likely are you to recommend splash damage to an appropriate friend or colleague? And then when they gave the answer, we just asked them why they gave the score that they did. Now, using the NPS system requires you to sort consumer satisfaction feedback into detractors and passives and promoters. And there's a lot of research on this, MIT, Stanford, Harvard, they've all come to the conclusion that if you can quieten the detractors, it gives the passives a chance to become promoters. If you can stop all the negativity that takes place in your car parks, your lobbies, your kitchens, your hallways, then the promoters get a larger voice. They become you know, much happier. They start to make much more progress. So that's what we did. We started giving feed, getting feedback. And we allowed the system to be completely anonymous. And I can tell you it was painful for the Splash Damage leadership team to read. When we started out, there was a lot of kind of flame wars going on in the boardroom, a lot of, a lot of issues being risen, you know, driven by people, mostly concerned about their egos, about how they were being criticized, about how you know, staff didn't understand, what do they know anyway, they don't have the big picture, and then we sort of hit on it, they don't seem to have the big picture, like a lot of the problems that exist in culture is, the board doesn't want to tell the employees what they're doing or what they're really doing, you know, they just don't want to share that information. Well, I said to them, look, imagine that we were a football team, and you went up into the crowd, the stalls, you know, the cheap seats, and you just listened to everything they said during a game. Now we know those guys in the stalls, they have massive passion for the team, they love them, they come every single week. They do it from the age of 13 to when they die. 
These are the most passionate, you know, engaged supporters that you can have at a team. But if you wrote down what they said and read it, you'd be pretty offended. <laughs> you know, the amount of cussing and complaint and aggression that you hear. But if you ignore that, if you kind of slice the top of it and say this is really just kind of referencing the emotion of the people that are working for you, and you try and tune into the key issues and you start fixing them, amazing things start happening. We noticed immediately, we just fixed the issues that detracted men, detractors mentioned, and then we communicated it back to the company as a whole. We never once tried to figure out who left the bit of feedback. We practiced this blind belief that if anyone said, oh, I know who that is, we just shut them up straight away. We don't want to know. If someone's complaining about something, let's fix it. And we did it month after month after month. 36 months we've done it now. But even after the first year, it started to have really dramatic impact. It started to make this really big difference. So then we started a leadership conference every six months, and we said to the company, right, we're going to create these steering groups, these thematic scorecards, but we're going to do it off-site, and we're going to bring all of that feedback from staff as well, and we're going to give it to everybody in the company, anonymized, so staff can't be identified, so they can use it in creating not just objectives that are good for the company's performance, but objectives that are good for staff engagement and happiness and making them fans, fans of the company itself. Now, this all seems good. We're making all of the right decisions. You know, we seem to be heading in the right direction, but we'd, I suppose, in our arrogance, which seems to sort of happen all the time, it's kind of hard for us. You know, it's sort of desperately trying to practice humility, and, be, and, and as we become really humble, we're like, yes, we're awesome at humility. <laughs> so, basically, I think just about the time when we took our next, uh, our first proper HQ, 26,000 square feet building, put in the planning permission to have our signs put on the top of the door. We had the worst crisis that we'd ever had. We had one customer, and we were struggling with those guys at the time, and we had a massive cash flow crisis. And this wasn't that long ago. And it, we came to the realization that, you know, we weren't just in trouble, we were seriously in trouble. There was a really serious risk that within the next quarter or so, people would actually be made redundant. Now, given that our first value is loyalty, and we have never had a redundancy at Splash Damage, this is 15 years of not one single staff layoff ever, and we will always say that you know, directors sacrificed their salaries long before staff would ever have to, the prospect of having to shut down the entire studio was driving me absolutely crazy. I was really, really, really worried about this prospect. And I couldn't really see what the solution was gonna be because the very people that we needed help from you know, were gonna be the people who would be most affected if we didn't sort this issue out. I kind of understood what had caused it, just to stop and briefly talk about the cause, Basically, we had one customer. If you're a video game studio and you have a single source of income, if that income goes away and you haven't got you know, decent cash flow protections in place, then of course you'll go bust. You know, that's gonna be a pretty significant issue. And I realized then that the solution is pretty obvious. We needed to move to a point where we had three customers. You know, perhaps if we really wanted to be risk averse, we'd have one in North America that was you know, on one stock market and another one at the other end of the world and they'd have different titles and different genres and different platforms and we'd slowly double or perhaps even triple you know, the number of titles that we're making but it would give us a much, much better risk profile. But we couldn't scale. You see, the leadership team that we had was the same leadership team that created the cash flow crisis. So if they didn't know how to avert the cash flow crisis, how could we scale up and not dilute management and become really good as a company working on multiple games? I knew what solution they would come up with. It would definitely involve Gantt charts and spreadsheets and resource management plans and a lot of plans. Now, I, I want to be clear and say, as a video games company, of course, we have to deliver every single video game that we work on on time and on budget and exceed quality expectations. But that's kind of just permission to play. When you're thinking about the grander thesis, the kind of bigger, grander plan for your company, it's much harder to keep that thing on track. There is one great book, Scale Up. It's written by the chairman of the entrepreneurs organization that is literally, it's like drinking from a fire hose. It has about a thousand white papers and ideas that solve almost any solution. But I couldn't find the solution in the book for that problem because the problem in my head was this vision of the building boarded up with just cues of, of staff walking out their kind of heads down like this, just feeling like we'd failed and it was over and that was kind of the end of the company. And then I had this idea, and it came from a really odd place, actually. Back in, I guess it was 98, 99, I played in a clan called Earthquakers, and I was their clan leader, and if I'm completely honest with you, we weren't very good. <laughs> we were, not only were we not very good, uh, everybody else that we played about had, had, had faster PCs, you know, they had better 3D graphics cards, they had better pings, because most of us were on ISDN at best, um, and they seemed to be, you know, higher skilled players. 
And then we developed this system, though, called dynamically modifiable offense and defense. It wasn't a prescriptive directive system. It was super, super simple. It just said, there's 10 people on the field, four of them are gonna defend, four of them are gonna attack, two of them are gonna be in the middle, but if we start losing our flag, those two are gonna join defense and we'll have six people locking down defense. Now this was radical because all Team Fortress teams played five defense, five attackers. You just didn't do it at all. If we got their flag moving, we'd lighten defense, and we'd move the two midfields forward. Now any of you that have ever been involved in sports know how incredibly naive this epiphany was of mine, but of course I've never been anywhere near a sport of any kind. So, so it's just, it just had never occurred to me. Well, this DMOD system was not just successful. We won the UK Team Fortress League in 98, and then we won the UK Team Fortress League in 99 as well. We only lost the title because Richard Jolly, my co-founder, who's in the audience today, and it's very painful to say this, actually came up with a better strategy when he was playing for QTL, which I'm sure stands for like Quake Losers, Time Losers. Anyway, QTL basically did this 12-player scout rush they ran straight at us very, very aggressively, nicked one flag, ran back to their base, and put 10 uh, minigunners, heavy weapons guys, on the front of their base for then the next hour, and beat us by 1-0, and thus we lost the championship. But what I learned very, very quickly was a simple system implemented really quickly that gives people a sense of what they can do in the moment and have confidence that their team will all align around them and do the same thing is essentially all that we needed. All that we needed was to come up with some kind of idea that would solve that. And that led us to our kind of uh, ultimate solution. We devised this basic little idea, and we call it a playbook. It's tiny. This thing answers those six questions. It tells people, you know, why we exist, how we behave, what we do. It has the four strategic anchors, which we change every six months if need be. It has what's important right now and the supporting objectives and the KPIs that we're working on, which also change every six months if need be. And then critically, every manager in the company who states the thing that they're working on, who comes with their team with an objective that's in line with the company's strategy, is defined and declared on the back. So everybody in the business knows exactly what's gonna happen and what they should do. I trained 60 managers personally in how to use this, not as a prescription, but as a kind of lens or filter through which they can see the world so they can come to autonomous decisions about what to do. And it's critically important. We don't hold people accountable for their performance when they fail. We hold people accountable for having terrible values. We fire assholes the second that we discover them. But we, if someone's performing at 80%, we don't care. We know we can solve that stuff with coaching. There are incredible incidental benefits that come from the practice of congruence, the attempt to become inside the company the same as the outside of the company, to be the same studio internally as the ones that the publishers interact with, that the platforms interact with, that the fans interact with. And there are some incredible benefits too. When I did DMOD, I made friends with my clan sniper, Simon. I visited him two or three times in Wales. 10 years later, I discovered that he had this astonishingly beautiful best friend. I proposed to her three weeks later. I married her about a year later, and we had a little boy called Fox. We called him Fox after Fox Mulder. That is how cool and sporty I am. <laughs> Incidental benefits can't be predicted. Trends can't be predicted. There's no idea where we're going as an industry. You can have a vision, that's certainly true. But as a person, if you have a moral compass, if you know where your line is and you stick to it, you'll be the kind of person that people want to make friends with, that people can depend on. As a company, if you act in a congruent way, you'll always know what to do, even if it feels like you have no idea what to do. Thank you very much. <laughs>